Hello, good evening, and welcome everyone. My name is Netanel Portier, and I'm director of the Mural Arts Institute, an initiative of Mural Arts Philadelphia. I have short brown hair, shoulder length, I'm wearing glasses. I am wearing a sleeveless black blouse with pink flowers on it, and I'm sitting in front of a virtual background overlooking the Schuylkill River and Philadelphia skyline. I am located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the land of the Lene Lenape. We acknowledge that the land on which we live and labor were stolen from the Lene Lenape peoples and their descendants who survived and remained in the homeland known as the Lenape Hoking and those in the diaspora who were forcefully removed as far as Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Canada and are still marginalized even in the city of brotherly love. We also acknowledge that Philadelphia has a unique position in the nation's founding and its successors are still responsible to help hold treaty rights for the land stolen and to correct the wrongdoings for the policies that led to the enslavement massacre and forced assimilation of the indigenous peoples across the USA. And the effects of this colonial genocidal legacy is yet to be addressed. Furthermore, we acknowledge that Philadelphia was built by Black African American peoples whose ancestors were stolen from Africa, and that the current social, economic, environmental, and political inequalities experienced by more recent BIPOC communities living in Philadelphia are a direct effect from the historical colonial violence that has been exerted for centuries against indigenous peoples of the Americas, including Native Hawaiians, Alaska Natives, Inuits, and indigenous Caribbeans. Knowing that you may be logging into tonight's event from communities farther than our own, please take a moment to reflect on the land you reside on and the relations that you are responsible for tending as a result. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight for this amazing conversation um, that I'm very excited about. Um, and I will introduce now to you all, Judy Baca, Dr. Judy Baca and Jane Golden. Um, before I do that, I just want to make sure that everyone is aware at the bottom of your screens in the Zoom menu, there is a live transcript button if, in case you would like uh, to see the, the, the uh, subtitles here on your screen during our session today. We will be taking questions from the audience at the end of our session around uh, 6.15. If you do have questions, please type them into the Q&A section. If you do put them in the chat box, uh, we will move them into the Q&A section so we can um, take a look at them at the end of our session today. So first I'd like to introduce Dr. Judy Baca, one of America's leading visual artists Dr. Judy Baca has created public art for four decades. Powerful in size and subject matter, Baca's murals bring art to where people live and work. In 1974, Baca founded the City of Los Angeles' first mural program, which produced over 400 murals, employed thousands of local participants, and evolved into an arts organization, the Social and Public Art Resource Center, SPARC. She continues to serve as Sparks Artistic Director while also employing digital technology in Sparks Digital Mural Lab to promote social justice and participatory public arts projects. Beginning with the awareness that the land has memory, Baca creates art shaped by an interactive relationship of history, people, and place. Her public artworks focus on revealing and reconciling diverse people's struggles for their rights and affirming the community's connections to place. Together with the people who live there, they co-create monumental public art places that become sites of public memory. In 2012, the Los Angeles Unified School District named a school the Judith F. Baca Arts Academy, located in Watts, her birthplace. She is a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship, the United States Artist Rockefeller Fellowship, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation grant awarded for the expansion of the Great Wall. Uh, I'm going to now uh, introduce Jane Golden as well, our other speaker. And then we're going to go back to Judy Baca, and, and uh, Judy and Jane will both uh, present their stories to us of how they started out their organizations, their works, and then we'll continue with the conversation. So Jane Golden, 
Jane Golden has been the driving force of Mural Arts Philadelphia since its inception, overseeing its growth from a small city agency into the nation's largest public art program and a global model for transforming public space and community through art. Under Golden's direction, Mural Arts has created over 4,000 works of public art through innovative collaborations with community-based organizations, city agencies, nonprofit organizations, schools, the private sector, and philanthropies. Reimagining the intersection of art and public space to address societal challenges, she has developed groundbreaking programs that transform practice and policies related to youth education, restorative justice, environmental issues, and behavioral health. Golden has overseen a series of increasingly complex, ambitious, and award-winning public art projects and launched the Knowledge Sharing Mural Arts Institute in 2017 to help guide, mural, to guide best practices across the globe. Sought after nationally and internationally as an expert on urban transformation through art, Golden has received numerous awards for her work, including the Eisenhower Exchange Fellowship Award, the Philadelphia Award, the Hepburn Medal from the Catherine Houghton Hepburn F Center at Bryn Mawr College, the Philadelphia Sketch Club Medal, and Philadelphia Magazine's Trailblazer Award. In 2018, she received the Anne Darnancourt Award for Artistic Excellence, from the Arts and Business Council of Greater Philadelphia and the Dare to Understand Award from the Interfaith Center of Greater Philadelphia. She is an adjunct professor at the University of Pennsylvania and serves on the Mayor's Cultural Advisory Council and the Board of Directors of the Heliotrope Foundation. Thank you both so much for joining me this evening. I'd love for uh, Dr. Judy Baca to share with us um, her story. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm uh, telling the whole story, but I'm going to take a moment to kind of give you some updates on uh, what has been a, our practice for the last 45 years. Sparks in its 45th year. It's, it's hard to imagine. And um, we are in the process of the expansion of the Great Wall Monument. So I'm going to share a screen and kind of take you through things quickly and, and bring you right up to date in the most recent piece that we, we just dedicated this last week. So let's get a little awkward moment here of bringing up a um, PowerPoint into the share screen thing here. Here we go. Okay, so um, I am beginning with a, 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 um, a view of the, um, the Great Wall of Los Angeles. I, I, I guess we can begin by saying that Spark began with this project. In fact, this was the first project of the, of the Social and Public Art Resource Center. And the reason that we became a nonprofit because we realized uh, as a city agency, we were under the, I, I began the mural program under uh, the city of Los Angeles Rec and Parks Department. And it was not possible for us to receive funding or support for that, for any productions without a nonprofit. So I fast found myself in the process of developing an institution, which was really not my intention. <laughs> I have to say that 45 years later was not the, that was not the central idea. The idea was to figure out a way to keep doing this work. Uh, this is a view down the Great Wall as it currently stands with about 750 feet still not in the image. So it, it's looking back from the, the 1940s uh, to the pre-culture um, uh, period. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. For those of you who don't, who are not seeing, I didn't describe myself. Um, that's kind of an odd thing, but I'll describe myself as best I can. I am uh, an aging muralist. <laughs> I have uh, um, salt and pepper hair, uh, pretty much uh, gray everywhere, uh, uh, but you know, still, still uh, shades of black. I'm wearing glasses. I have a, a, a satin red shirt and red and black shirt, um, which are, it's the colors of the farm workers and also um, a Venice artist that made these things by hand, which I really love. Um, I am um, standing, I'm actually sitting in my um, studio in the Venice canals. I live in Venice. Our organization is in the Venice, in Venice, and 
an old repurposed police station. And uh, so this is my study and behind me are um, hundreds of books and materials that are all on uh, a lot on public art and muralism. Uh, so that gets you a kind of good uh, beginning here. And um, looking uh, on this, this next slide, I'm, I'm showing an image of the, uh, from the Great Wall, I'm showing you an image that is a really early image about 1929 and was the basis of why the Great Wall came into being. This is the Los Angeles River and the city fathers in about the 1919 or so after another flood, um, the river had a tendency to expand in the winter and then contract in, uh, in the summer. And um, the indigenous people lived alongside this river for uh, thousands of years and they, they accommodated uh, their life and, and, and movement uh, to the river. But as real estate became the central aspect of LA, uh, the river had to be tamed. And the city fathers in what turned out not to be the wisest move began to concrete the river. So what I'm showing you here is that process of the, um, the making of the channels throughout the city of Los Angeles, which created a lot of issues of problems of um, dirt belts on either side. Here you can see in early 1976 or so, dirt on either side of these channels. And of course, these areas were areas where uh, children played. As a child, I lived near the Los Angeles River and we ran into the river to catch tadpoles and frogs and to, we had a, actually had our own park in the inner city. Um, and uh, in, in, in this region, um, which was up Coima, I, I was born in Watts and then we moved into an area that is also really famous uh, uh, called Pacoima. And Pacoima is well known for it being the home of Richie Valens and the, um, uh, the Pacoima air crash. There's a many, many stories about this in the San Fernando Valley. So this is where the Great Wall is. And the dirt belt on either side, you can see in the very early um, development of the Great Wall. Um, this was actually a, a kind of a, an egregious act. And it was not something that anybody could speak aloud at the time. But when I was called in to take a look at the site with the arm, by the Army Corps of Engineers, who got through building all of the channels throughout the city, and instead of standing back and saying, well, you know, kind of like after their creation saying, now this is good, they said, oh my God, what have we done? Uh, we've created these divisions between communities. We've created these major problems uh, in terms of water moving too, too quickly to the ocean. Um, we've seen pollution become more prevalent um, we've lost the water going into the aquifer and all of the kind of concurrent problems that occur when these kinds of decisions are made without a thoughtful relationship to the earth. And um, so I looked at this and I actually saw this as a possibility of bringing youth together from different communities that I had been working in, in the, in the city's program, mural program, and creating a tattoo on the scar where the river once ran. And so the, under, the underlying metaphor, and in fact, I must say secret metaphor, was that we were kind of recovering, we we're trying to recover the stories of the people who lived alongside of the river, those people who were easily disappeared. Uh, when it was possible to disappear a river, it was much easier to disappear the people. So this began uh, my process of actually bringing people together from all over the city of Los Angeles. Our city is very, a segregated city. And um, it's kind of not really well known. I mean, if you look at Hollywood's images or you look at uh, tourist attractions, you don't really get a sense of the, the divisions within this within the city. So in uh, 1976, I embarked on this, I proposed this idea that we would begin to paint a narrative and that that narrative would include the stories of all these different people. And we would begin to do research and recover what was unknown and uh, so this is actually, I, there's a little kind of division of the spaces um, that we use for, for our research. And uh, we began, of course, with academic research and looking at popular cultural imagery. imagery. And, but very important was lived experience, people who lived through particular periods and who could um, help us collect metaphors, um, the stories that would become metaphoric and therefore image-based. Um, we looked at expert and not so expert, and what we meant by that was biases and, and the, the, what we thought about each other, like we, uh, the, the, the divisions between African-American and Latino were very prevalent in the neighborhoods I grew up in. 
Um, so all of these things were connected and, and, and all of that was viewed through prisms. And the prisms, as we assess the imagery, had to do with age, with race, with gender and sexuality, with your immigration status, with your educational achievement, and of course, underlying everything, class. Um, I love this picture we pulled out of the archive, which is a wonderful image of a number of people who were looking at the imagery and, and, and it's really um, very antique. On the right, you're seeing a, uh, a set of um, uh, little thumbnails, uh, sketches and index cards and very primitive way of collecting information from different people and scholars. And I've invited a number of artists into the studio to help me think about it. And there's some rather interesting people. Um, Matt Worker in the background is uh, a, a young guy at this point. He's like 26 years old and he's a Pulitzer Prize cartoonist. And next to him is Judy Chicago, who is giving me a, a big feminist critique on how I'm representing feminism within this seg segment. And Ed Burrell, who in the bodacious Bugarillas, who, who is a Black Panther performer who was like coming in, giving a read on how we should represent the African-American community. And Magoo uh, from Los Four uh, is also in the room. There were many people who, who walked through the studio and helped us develop the content. Um, whoops. So then uh, what I want to see, let's see if I'm, okay. Um, what this, this, each of the segments were divided and developed into blueprints. These are a quick view of the grids and the, and the deportation sequence uh, that is represented in the wall. And, and still what we put in the mural are images that don't exist anywhere else in Los Angeles. They are the only representation of the massive deportation of over a half a million people in 1933. And this is directly from the newspaper. Officers hurl back alien horde and the kind of language that is used to villainize uh, immigrant people. And uh, you can see the dollar amount, the Southern Pacific Railroad made $14.95 ahead as they put people onto the trains. Uh, this is the final image. Um, we've had to adjust those numbers upward because when we first um, put this together, we put 250,000 uh, Mexicans deported and I was corrected multiple times as, they, as the research came in as, and as people came to the, to the site of the mural and said, I was deported and I was an American, I was a citizen and they just gathered us up in the buses. And so we had to change to Mexican Americans. So these are segments uh, that became uh, these kinds of drawings. And um, this is from a lived experience of one of the um, um, uh, officers from the Fighting 442nd, which was a regiment of J uh, Japanese American soldiers during World War II. And they said, um, the survivor said to me, you know, we were the very fabric of America recruited out of the, out of the concentration camps. And uh, that gave us the concept metaphorically of the stripes, them becoming the stripes of the American flag as they turn in their instruments, uh, of their, their rapes, the rakes, their cameras and um, radios were outlawed for Japanese uh, people during the forties. This is the final image. And this is about a 50 foot image um, the, the height you're looking at is about 13 and a half feet. Uh, again, no, no, no marker anywhere in our city that talks about Mrs. Laws, who was the woman who broke the Black Covenant laws. After World War II, she lived in an area um, that was an African-American community called Watts, and she refused to move. She was um, pressed to move out. And uh, this is actually from her protests in front of her house. We fight fascism abroad and at home I didn't have to make this up. I took it from the actual stories that uh, the people um, uh, documented of, of that particular moment. Mrs. Laws, we interviewed, now she's now gone, but an amazing person who essentially broke the Black Covenant Law. Um, this is um, the division of the Maderos and Dodger Stadium descending down into the, um, uh, the Great Wall site, I mean, uh, to the, the Chavez Ravine um, which was a, the oldest Mexican community in Los Angeles. And we painted it as if it was a spaceship descending into this region. And the communities being divided up by the freeways that you know, targeted uh, minority communities uh, that uh, divided up the spaces. So what we're doing right now is we're beginning the new segments. And these are, these are not public yet. They're, they're from the studio, just taken off the walls. 
uh, as we begin to work on the 1960s segment. And the segment that we're working on right now, this is a rough uh, a piece that we're calling the generation on fire. And this is all the young, innocent, um, uh, young people who begin a revolution of sorts. They become revolutionaries and they uh, have fire in their chest. And of course the, the, the hoses uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, the fire department, the Montgomery, Alabama fire department, we're using that image of putting the fire out. The sky is filled with crows as they try to break the Jim Crow uh, period of time. They try to stop the, the Jim Crow. Another one that we're proposing at this point, these are not, you have to color their, it's a, that's the lunch counter image. Uh, a snake, which is a rattlesnake comes running through the, the lunch counter as people sit in, uh, in, in, a, in a very studied way uh, to change the, um, uh, the segregation uh, uh, in, in all over the United States. And this, uh, it, uh, it happened in Los Angeles, it happened in the South. We, we know the, the stories of the Woolworths that wouldn't allow black people to sit at the counters. And um, in the background, you hear music coming out of the jukebox and it's Nina Simone who's playing the pianos and she's playing a song uh, that has become uh, a really um, uh, well known from because of her called Mississippi Goddamn. So the Great Wall Institute will now be conducted in this way. Uh, as we're moving in this next, next segment, we're planning with the new technology to be able technology to be able to work interiorly, to work inside, and get ourselves out of that channel, which is not the most pleasant place to be. <laughs> it is a river, concreted. It is filled with heat and uh, runoff water. Um, it can be 118 degrees in that space, and it's also very, very dangerous. And um, our plan in the next um, realm is to kind of imagine ourselves with air conditioning. <laughs> what about that idea? What about a toilet? <laughs> and what about the capacity to make food in this place? Uh, so this is, a, this is the um, proposed site, which will give us about a 350 foot segment on either side so that we can develop two segments at a time uh, and they can be seen across from each other. Uh, we're also right now in the, in the throes of building an interpretive green bridge. And this is pretty exciting because on the left side of this eight acre monument park, um, we have three schools. One, a continuing school for at-risk youth. Um, the second, a high school. And then the third, a, a junior college. And that's all blocked off from the neighborhoods on the opposite side by uh, the fact that the young people have to walk all over a mile around the channel to get to a bus. And uh, so we're putting the bridge back into a place where people can cross in the middle and they can also use it as a viewing station. So this is a view of what I'm just describing in the, in the park. The mural is on the left-hand side um, of that chair. This is a drone shot, gives you a, an overview. Technology has made it possible for us to see it from all these different ways and to design in this way. We've just finished our designs of the laser cut um, animals and, and um, marine life. So that when you're standing on the bridge, the interpretive bridge, will uh, facing the San Gabriel Mountains, you'll be seeing all the animals that lived in this region before it became concrete and before it became so filled with uh, suburban housing. And the opposite direction, you'll be facing the ocean and there you'll see the marine life. And hopefully as young people make this passage, as people come through, they'll understand that if they drop things in the water, they're going to the ocean, right? And they'll understand that these are the creatures that lived and populated this region. Um, so this is our plan for that. Oh, this would be before I get off this. This is in the process now we have, where we are currently now is we're about to drill these giant holes into the ground, which will put the stanchions in and the bridge will be dropped into onto these stanchions. It's a 90 foot expanse. Um, we have wired and put up the lighting and we have to yet plug it in. And that means the entire mural will be lit at night. So this very dark, sort of inhospitable region will be made a place where people can walk at night, unheard of in the San Fernando Valley. Um, we are um, in the process uh, of um, getting our final permit uh, for the bridge. It's been quite an, a deal to try and get something like this put up. One would think we we're building a freeway, 
but all we're doing is making it possible for people to walk across the channel. So um, I am in the process of recruiting people now to be illustrators on the team, to, to work with me in the development of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, to try to bring it to the current time. So that's our task in the next two years. Uh, and we're shooting for the painting of the work by the time of the 1928, I mean, 2028 Olympics. Um, so that's an update on, um, on the Great Wall and what began Spark. And um, an update that comes from just days ago is the completion of this work, which we've been working on for three years during a pandemic and all the social justice movements of, that have actually uh, transformed our, our, our country and, and, and brought visibility to the world after George Floyd's murder. Um, uh, we produced this work, which is our first uh, full-scale digital mural that is permanent. In other words, this is a piece that can go into a public environment. It's not ink, it's made with minerals. So therefore it is embedded in this glass and it makes it possible for it to be um, put in an outdoor site. And what we're doing here is we're putting, we put together the hundredth anniversary of UCLA, but we actually did a different story. The story is about those people who are thought leaders, who were workers in social justice and who became um, very important in the history of UCLA. And this was a great moment because we got to you know, populate this whole land. Uh, we began with the land, we worked ourselves up from the land and began to tell the story of beginning with Toy Purina, who led the, the, revolt, the revolt in 1785 against the Mission San Gabriel, which was the founding mission of Los Angeles. Uh, she was 25 years old and she came brought people from Utah, as far away as Utah, and was then banished from, uh, from um, the Mission San Gabriel. And so she is the center image. And you'll recognize two other, the Trinity, I call them the, the Holy Trinity of women, um, uh, Angela Davis and Dolores Huerta. Uh, and to the right, um, Maria Elena Dorazo, who is a union organizer and uh, um, in the last on the image to the right. and. Um, John Lewis on the left, all associated in one way or another over history with, with uh, UCLA. This is uh, our opening night, the, just the other night. The mural becomes luminescent in the night. This is not backlit. It's the way the glass deals with light. So the lights are coming from out exterior and the whole thing is glowing uh, as we're opening the piece. And of course, what is remarkable is the story is not ended. The Tongva woman who's represented in the image here, this is the descendant of this uh, woman uh, in a Desiree uh, Baragon who is speaking and who is as revolutionary as her ancestor, talking about the lack of representation of Native people at UCLA. And Maria Elena Dorazo is giving one of her speeches um, that actually uh, yielded justice for janitors and the hotel and restaurant workers union. And now she's a state Senator. So that gives you the most current view. Um, the rhizomes that are coming out from the heart of Westwood are putting out the fire on the edge of the earth um, as knowledge begins to change the way we deal with our planet and with each other. So that's it. Oh, all of this is done here in the digital lab. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much, Judy. It's incredible to see that just the trajectory and how it's all connected. Um, it's just it's it's indeed, really it's not, and it's just uh, uh, that I wanted to give you um, an overview, but also give you the up to date. Yeah, thank you. And so now I'm going to hand it over to Jane Golden. Jane, if you can as well give us a little bit of context for Mural Arts Philadelphia and your trajectory from then through now. Well, I'm actually here because Judy Baca hired me like a long time ago um, and gave me a start. And um, I was totally inspired by her, uh, by Judy, by your courage and tenacity and grit and uh, vision. You know, it's really extraordinary. And seeing this work, it almost, I'm just almost moved to tears. It's so beautiful, so stirring and so important. Like it, it's, it's, Really, thank I really want to thank I want to thank you for everything you've done and thank you for being here tonight and thank you for giving me that job in Santa Monica. 
and, You're and, amazing. <laughs> and Jane, thank you for the acknowledgement. That that's something we really uh, we all need to do: acknowledge each other. Yeah, thank you're right. you. Of course. All right, everybody. So um, I'm going to share the screen, and I'm going to um, go fast. So let me uh, go here. So uh, to the slideshow. And I'm going to go, we're going to, okay. so I'm going to start back in the day, but I'm not going to hang out. I'm not going to be there too long. So, so I got my start in LA. Thanks to Judy, did murals there, got really sick. I have lupus, came back East to be with my family. Um, I read about when I was coming up to Philadelphia for, to come to the hospital here, I read about the Philadelphia anti-graffiti network started by Wilson Good. And while I know that, um, Good's legacy has been tainted deeply and profoundly by MOVE, which is was a horrible tragedy in our city that has yet to be reconciled. Um, the first few years of the Good administration were so interesting. Um, coming to Philadelphia at a time when the city had elected its first black mayor was just an honor. And um, I was hired to run a teeny little art program for the anti-graffiti network. And every, I love this picture because everyone looks so happy because they're all swearing that they will never write on walls for the rest of their lives, but this was never true. So anyway, if you liked art, you were sent to me and I was supposed to very quickly figure out some kind of alternative to graffiti writing. But what I did was I sort of fell in love with the graffiti writers because I found out like they had just enormous talent. And together we created this mural program and we started working with block captains and community leaders. And people said to us repeatedly, when we asked, do you want murals here? People said, you know what? Things are done to us or not done. And the only visual stimulation we have here are billboards advertising alcohol and tobacco. And we would say, what would you like here? And then people started to talk about, oh, really? Like, oh, how about um, like memories of where we grew up? How about like a hero down the block? How about something beautiful and pastoral because we're tired of the blight? And whatever it was, we'd like listened carefully. And because of anti-graffiti, I mean, it sort of was a name. It didn't really represent it because it wasn't like we were like a punitive organization. It was all about giving people opportunities. I mean, we employed thousands and thousands and thousands of young people. And um, I worked with community organizers who really mentored me. And they were like, you're going into neighborhoods. Listen, 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 be respectful. It's someone else's home. And so after a while, like we went in and we were just like, we were there just to absorb everyone's life stories. And here, this, this is, these are four women who became real role models to me. And um, uh, we heard over and over again, you know, we like Tomasita and Iris would say in Spanish, what we get from the city is they had a phrase that was, it meant the tail of the cow. Um, Willie May and um, Miss Bagby, Rachel Bagby would say, you know, Jane, we just need to do it ourselves. And that's what we saw, this amazing resilience and grit everywhere. And it was contagious. And so we started working with people and really shining a light on the authorship across Philly to do murals. And I know like we've got over 4,000 works of art now and it doesn't, it seems like, okay, murals, but it was like revolutionary that suddenly these walls were being turned into works of art that looked like people who lived there that reflected their stories. And for me, someone who's very interested in cities and in art, it was like I was on fire. Like, how can we be extra intentional um, to really put art to work on behalf of citizens, but keeping people who live in the community in the center and artists at the center. So we started doing tons of murals. And here's, I love this one. This is still here, the Black Family Reunion. And then, tribute to Diego Rivera. This one, I am large, I contain multitudes. And then Dr. J, we did this with uh, the artist Kent Twitchell. And this people were like, what? It's the doc and screeching to a halt. And also there were all these cynics back then. People said, the walls will get graffiti. The kids you're working with will get in trouble again. And I was just like, stop, stop, stop. I'm not gonna hear it. We don't wanna hear any cynicism. We don't, if, if anyone's wasting their time, it's us. And that's our business, not your business. And, but the minute we started doing murals, there was no graffiti. And then I, I showed this image because this was painted in 1989. It has never been defaced thousands of projects later. No, things don't get to face. Why? Because there's a sense of ownership and because there's been collaboration. This is Annie Uribe. And then we became Mural Arts in 1998 and like, ta-da, we're a pro art program. In some way, we never look back. Look at this. I'm just going to pick out a few to show you. Meg Seligman's eight-story masterpiece that gives kids the dignity and respect they deserve. 
beautiful murals like this one by David Gwynn. This one, Dr. Sean White by Ernell Martinez, extraordinary person who died all too young. And he would do, he was a, a doctor in public health and would do all his work in barbershops and churches. So that's how we got the content for this mural and barbershops and churches had all these after, after school programs. Joe Frazier, yay. And then this is, um, we also employed like over 225 artists every year, providing artists with decent pay and a place to work in public space because the history of public art, as Judy knows, has been so a feat. The door is not always open. And so the more we can do for artists, the more we wanna do. Look at that, that's brand new, um, almost 10 stories tall. Femi, South Philly, Tim McFarlane. Look at this one, Sean Theodore, photography. Well, the Freedom Fighters, here we have um, Gabe Tiberino and Felix St. Fort, how one person can inspire, inspire a generation of activists. The Freedom Fighters, now they're in their 70s and 80s, but we wanted to acknowledge them and the power that they have. Salsa, here we have, look at this, it's just, and then in, we serve about 2,000 young people every year, ranging in age from 11 through 18. Look at this by Michelle Ortiz. Half of it was painted in Juarez, Mexico, half in Philadelphia. It's about the impact of deportation. And for young people, it's about project-based learning. We want them to know that they can have an idea and they can bring it to fruition. And they can do billboards about citizenship. They can transform schools. They can work with, um, they do, do branding. We have an entrepreneurial program. They can you know, take their design work and, and put it to work in very practical ways. And Porchlight programs are a partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health. where We work with people grappling with trauma, addiction, housing insecurity. We work in new immigrant communities. Um, here we have, this is an Iraqi artist and a Philly artist. We'll go fast. Making home movies where we work with people doing video and uh, poets and ESL instructors. We have a same day work program where we pay people in the morning and people transform our public transit concourse. And then we identify what are the barriers to employment and we do our best to act on that. So art can be useful, put art to work. I don't know why it always gets marginalized. Okay, I'm gonna go fast. Look at this, this is a, a project that is a tribute to the trans community, the first mural about the trans community. I don't know what took us so long, but we got to it and it's important and it's a beacon and it's super important. But every project that you see, it's sort of deceptively complex because it's the result of a lot of programmatic work. Oh, look, Betsy Casanias. And then I love this. This is um, part of the Healing Verses. Uh, we worked with the Poet Laureate in the city and we worked in Kensington, a part of our city, if you don't know, that's been torn apart by the opioid and heroin crisis. Uh, but the, the story of us, there is always light here. And that's what we feel that art can do. So let me go fast. We're working everywhere, restorative justice. We worked with people at a state prison. We've been working in the state prison for 20 years. It was Greaterford, now it's Phoenix. Um, and we worked with uh, victims, victims advocates, did a series of projects together about the forgiveness. This is about the impact of prison on families, their QR codes, you can also hear People's Voices by Eric Oakday. Look at this. And then we have, when we started our reentry program in 2008, it's called the Guild. It's like the Renaissance. We're working in all, all areas, providing people with pay, with opportunities, leadership opportunities, technology, and then opportunities to work in public space. So before, after a basketball court. This is by Ian Pierce and Betsy Casanias, really beautiful underpasses. Look at this by Russell Craig. We met Russell at Graterford. He's now graduating from Bard next week and his work is now, I could not afford it and I'm so happy. It's becoming super well-known. Um, our guild program, we, we serve about 150 people every year. We also have fellowships, a fellowship program for artists impacted by the, the justice system. This is by Deb Willis and Michelle Jones. So here's the same people on one side and the other side. Uh, here's Jess X Snow. It's James Huffy. We have a, an artist in residency program in the DA's office. Look at that, our Women's Guild, our Women's Reentry Program. We started this two years ago. Yay, our graduation. Environmental justice. We're doing a big global um, climate justice initiative, transforming schools. There's the Mural Arts Institute. Thank you, Netanyahu, for all you do. Then just a little treat. Here, look at this Monument Lab, Paul Farber and Ken Lum. This is Hank Willis Thomas. Um, Monument Lab, we challenge Philadelphians to think what is an appropriate monument for the current city of Philadelphia. Look at that. Hank Willis Thomas, this is Karen Olivier who wrapped a war memorial in a material that was like a mirror. So you, when you looked at it, you saw yourself. Cheryl Walensky did this bus all about the 47 route. Steve Powers, the airport. This is really beautiful. We're working with light. 
Rebecca Rudstein is right here. And then we also work in non-mural ways because we think that we're really eager just to tap into the cultural sector. Um, this was about drawing attention to our new rail park. We work with videographers and musicians, and this is a floating laboratory performing arts space that's being built in Southwest Philly, a part of our city that has been neglected for all too long. Bartram's garden is like a gem, and this is uh, designed by the head of the, uh, she was the head of the architecture department at MIT. She's now at Cornell, um, and it's gonna be just incredible and provide access uh, to the river to a lot of people. And that's really what we believe deeply in access and opportunity and the power of art. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. That was a little speedy. I know some folks are asking to see more slides, but uh, <laughs> you can definitely explore our website. There are so many projects that you can um, explore online and learn more about. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to start with a somewhat complex question, and for our audience, we might go a little bit uh, over, <laughs> over time as well. Um, so Judy and Jane, you have both been, or you are both, forces of energy, an incredible amount of energy building these organizations, um, employing so many artists, creating so many public images that we don't see anywhere else, right? That's what you were saying earlier. Like these are these are the images we do not see every day, um, or that we would would traditionally, you know. There's also today. Do we do we are murals monuments, right? Would we traditionally recognize murals as monuments in the past, or or are we doing so today? And you've both navigated complex politics, painful memories, and transformed public spaces. So how do you how do you navigate that? How do you navigate traditional representations or expectations of how public memory should be represented um, and maintain your commitment to truth, justice, and the communities that you want to see represented um, in our public spaces? How do you navigate that? <laughs> Either of you jump in. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. Well, I, I mean, that's a, it's kind of a complex question. I mean, like, how do you navigate public memory? I don't think that necessarily monuments have been about public memory at all. I think uh, essentially they have been about the aggrandizement of victories over things. Uh, so look, look at if you look at the history of monuments in the United States, I, I, I did a survey at one point in which I wanted to do this lecture for the Women's Caucus about you know, representation of women in monuments. I, I, I couldn't find any. I could only find them as muses. I could find them as, you know, sort of reference that were not real people. And um, I was kind of delighted when I was in Canada and British Columbia and in front of the, um, the Empress Hotel, there was a bronze statue of Emily Carr on the corner with her dogs. Uh, and I mean, here's the great Georgia Keefe of the Northwest. It's the only, piece I've ever seen of a, a monument to a woman artist. So I don't, I, first I would not say that monuments have been about necessarily public memory. They've been about the aggrandizement of certain victors. And the real question is to begin with whose story gets remembered, whose story gets told. And then if you're working in, uh, in, a, in a realm in which you're trying to think about it in a different way, um, that's the beginning. That's the beginning of what we need to be doing now. And that provides a kind of um, convivial space, a welcoming space for all people, right? But literally think of it. Um, my grandmother told me the story about the revolution in Mexico and how when the horse, the horses came, uh, you know, they came riding in, the horsemen came riding in. This is around 1918 or so. And uh, which we were seeing as the bottom of the hoofs of horses, and they were terrifying as they came galloping through the spaces. And really, that's the that's the view we have of many monuments: the bottom of the hoofs uh, of, of of bronze statues and men sitting on top of those bronze statues. So first, we have to begin with that thought. I mean, I'm sure Jane can jump in here now. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think what's interesting, Judy, is during Monument Lab, I remember one of the artists held a session to get ideas. It was uh, Sharon Hayes and she was doing a project about the lack of women in uh, public monuments in our city. And 
a number of younger people, actually, when she asked them about their experience with monuments, they said, well, our experience is really with murals and there are monuments. And I thought it's really murals are, and I see this when I look at your work, I feel intimacy in a public space. I feel the space is vast, but the relationship feels very like it's between us. And I think that's something that people in Philly have always grasped that this collection is really for them. The fact that we have a waiting list of people who want work. And when you read the mural applications, it's people want, you know, they talk about memory. They talk about like somebody who made a difference in the community and, but whatever it is, it's sort of like, it's being generated in this organic way from citizens where monuments were sort of imposed, right? There's something cold and just distancing about them. And what's interesting too is back in the day, and I had shared this, I think with you the other day, that people were so critical of our work. They were like, what you're doing, this is not public art. And I'd be like, we're in public doing art. If we're not doing that, what are we doing? And they would be like, you're doing social work. And they would say it as if they had like a lemon in their mouth, like it was like, Grr. and I'd be like, well, social work is a noble profession, A. And B, like, what is this really about? And they would say, well, sculpture is legitimate. And I was like, what? And it's, it's taken years, years to turn that tide, but we turned it. <laughs> I kept saying the kids I was working with, hold your heads up. We're doing great work. <laughs> this work matters. But I mean, it was, a, it's a long haul, as you know, but I look at your work. I just feel like, oh, so validated, vindicated, like, on a mission. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I really like seeing uh, what you were showing today of, of the range of all the people and all the different applications and methods that that were used uh, um, uh, to get pieces into public realm. I mean, uh, our, pro our pro uh, productions, uh, um, I showed just some of our recent works, but um, we produce works in community, uh, hiring different artists to do them. Uh, and uh, and that was actually very, um, it was a great struggle to get those pieces up. Well, we had no problem getting the community behind an artist and behind an idea. What we had trouble with was getting public permissions as the murals became well known uh, and more uh, of interest. By that time we had hundreds of pieces up and and then it became a place where a councilman would call us and say, you know, I'm running for office. I, we'd like, I'd like to see my portrait on the corner of, you know, of Brooklyn and Soto because that's my district. I mean, so we started to be solicited for use of the murals as advertising and a kind of um, a branding of them as being a good person, right? So in other words, the murals had this cachet. So uh, then it was a question of how to control that. And um, that's why the Spark ended up being a nonprofit and not being a city agency. And when we became a sit, not a city agency and a nonprofit, then we were scrambling every year for funding from city agencies. And, and because our city, I mean, I think we were talking the other day, um, Jane and I, about how it is a lot about the structure of the politics of our various cities that our programs developed in different ways, right? We have 15 councilmanic districts, which are basically fiefdoms. And we have to get through each of these council districts uh, support to fund a, a, a citywide mural program. And yet without a citywide mural program, you don't have policies, you don't have standardization, you have no uh, um, uh, you know, public input into the production of the works. And that is really important. I mean, but it's also important to allow the individuation and the individual's voices of various and very variant communities. There was at one point a councilman uh, when, when we were doing the citywide mural program, uh, which, which was really basically the mayor saying, would you replicate the Great Wall all, all over the city? I mean, first of all, <laughs> that piece, which was so difficult to do, they thought we could just move it, well, you do another half a mile over here, right? Uh, and uh, what we, we, we said, no, no, it's not, that's just not possible, right? I mean, it's like, you know, but as we got these pieces into various communities and we started to, to put them up, then they became uh, almost immediately censored, right? And I had a councilman who basically said, well, we don't want any murals in our district. And he managed to keep us from working in one of the city's council districts in total, no mural. He said, our people don't like murals. And then we had people in other districts saying, oh, this is so identified with people of color that we don't want murals because it's gonna degrade our property values. 
right? Yes. And then we had the next, you know, there were different various levels of, of, of issues. We have a changing population. This may have been an African-American community, but it isn't any longer. And why are you putting that image that has a dominant African-American uh, imagery within it? So in other words, Los Angeles had these changing populations. And then the question is, is it relevant? And should those things be changed? And we have advocated very strongly that monuments should not be taken down, that they should be contextualized and that there should be additional works done because it's important for us to rec record what it is that we valued at different times, even to the, to the bronze soldiers on, on horseback, because in that context, you understand the whole story of, of America and the whole story of who we were and who, who we're becoming. That's the really interesting story. Who we're becoming. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. Jane, and uh, go ahead. Yeah, Jane, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the structural, uh, you know, how we're structured here within the city, too. Like, I think that's really important what Judy was talking about in terms of the different challenges and or opportunities. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we sort of came up a different way, like, I think because of anti-graffiti being a pure city program and because we were working so much with block captains and community leaders and trying hard to be a bridge between the community and the city, which we were really eager to do. We were like, you need to get a hold of LNI, the streets department. You know, my former boss was always saying the commissioner called and said a group of artists is they're reporting something about a pothole. Is that you? And we'd be like, yes. Cause we were like busybodies, you know, we were like, but, but like good busybodies, busy bodies, like, you know, we were like on a mission. So, um, so when we became mural arts, it was like hard, like that was part of our DNA. Like, oh, we work for the city. We want to be relevant, useful. We want to put art to work. So I would say, um, and then there was another mayor, John Street, who made us part of the division of social services and his the, the person, one of his main leaders in the, the administration, this woman is still Richmond, she believed that art should be part of how big departments do business. So that was like life changing for us and super exciting. Now it had its own challenges, right? So we could not, at some point it was very clear because people would say to me, why is your work not more political? It was political, but we go up to a like sort of up to a line. Now, I think over the last number of years, it's actually become much more political. But in those early days, we were building trust, we were building a base, we were building support. And then it was clear that we had a lot to lose if things went wrong, like a lot of people's jobs, a lot of opportunity. Like, so it became like, how do you create, like, how do you balance this? Like being responsive to citizens, but also like holding like sort of space for artists to do their work and do good work and be creative. Um, and so it's, it's constantly like, I feel like, oh, we're like holding like 50 trays and trying to do good work. However, what's I, sort of ironic and interesting is that as we have become more and more embedded into the life of this city, there has been much more trust and the work has expanded in, in not just content, but the ways we're working. So it's like, it sort of is growing and growing in ways. I, I think probably 10, 12, 15 years ago, I would not have predicted, which is, I think is, is really a good thing. And now I see there's sort of a movement afoot to really sort of be more of a platform so that voices can be heard and that there is a desire for us even to push ourselves even more as it relates to supporting artists, like through fellowship programs, apprenticeship, internship programs. Um, and then of course the Institute, which is all about knowledge sharing. So, but I feel like we, we were pretty much like how do we make the city better? How do we make the city better? How does art do that? What's the role of art? Um, and then that's, it's sort of the, then we sort of expanded from that. But we, we, we're conscious that we're a city program. And if someone wants to do something highly volatile and political, they should go do that. There's no, there's no, there's no mural police in Philly. They can do it. And it's better for them to do it than for us to do it because we have too much to do. However, I will say, that I have gotten more courageous over the years, but I've been very inspired by Judy Baca. I mean, I've always been courageous, like I'll, I'll speak truth to power, but it's all, it's about like, I'm like an advocate, you know, I'm somebody who like, I'm an artist who wants to be a lawyer. So I'll advocate, advocate, advocate all the time. I have no problem doing that, right? But I sort of try to understand 
where we might go off if we go too far one way, what, what the ramifications and consequences might be. But we're a little bolder and take more risks now. It's good. It's good. <laughs> so there's a question here from the audience about um, how you each would sort of compare the mural art scene of Philly and LA. But I want to sort of um, include, add to that question too, you know, based on what you're seeing and experiencing today and have experienced in the past, what advice do you have for the next generation of movement builders and, and, and muralists who, who, you know, are sort of in your, in your line of trajectory um, with the same mission of, of justice and equity um, and giving voice to those that don't have their voice in public space? <clears throat> well, I can jump in here a bit on this. I think, I think one of the things that we, we really need to work on is creating a training institute so that um, there's a capacity to, to, to deal with the full history of muralism because it really goes back to the very beginning of art, you know, from the very first marks on, on walls and on, on our caves. And, you know, it's, it's a natural instinct of people to 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 make imagery in the places that they live and work, and uh, at the same time, uh, Los Angeles, for example, if you're looking at the comparison, Los Angeles lost its mural program, and there was no citywide program, and and there was an ordinance against murals. So in other words, it became so extreme that there was no way to get funded to do work, and so therefore, what went out onto the streets was pieces that were throw up pieces, pieces that were spray can pieces that had to be done really quickly. So even really good spray can artists had no time to conceptualize, design, transfer, create a, a really beautiful image because they had to do it in minutes before they were caught by the police. So that actually created a, a kind of denigration of the form. In other words, the form did not advance in a way that was really important for more than 10 years while well, this happened. And this was about sign painters. Was, I mean, if you look at the history of what was going on, it was like um, sign painting companies that were putting up billboards realized that murals could get up into spaces that, were, um, that they couldn't access because of the sign ordinance. So they began to present themselves as murals. And so therefore, um, the, the legislation became more extreme and it was effective at stopping the muralists, but really, in fact, it was never really effective at stopping the billboards. You know, there were people who would buy a building facing the freeway for no other reason than to use it for very high priced advertising on the sides of the building. You mean you make a Coors bottle that's 10 stories tall, right? So what, what, so we saw what we had was a denigration of the form and no continuance of like the transfer of content and information in the study, like how you could, young artists were learning from working alongside of a more exper experienced muralist. And that's really important and effective. So I think one of the things we need to do is really begin to break the systems that don't recognize muralism as an, as an important endeavor. And that means our universities have to wake up. They have to begin to say, yes, this is an important, fine art pursuit, and that there is a legacy and a tradition that, um, that supports it, and a, a knowledge base that is really critical and important and complicated and complex. Integration of art into architecture is no easy feat and something that one has to study to be able to do it well. So I think that's one of the things we need to do in the future is work on uh, training. And the other thing is that we need to break down these stereotypes and the fear that um, essentially we're dealing with as a country. We're seeing, we were probably on the very first lines of what became the division in the country. You know, we have this terrible division right now within, within our country. Uh, and where those people who are working in public spaces, we were seeing it really early. We were seeing these divisions like you know, um, people coming to public meetings about a mural and saying, we don't want that in our community because it has an ethnic flavor, right? And I couldn't really, I wonder what flavor that was. Like, I was like, oh, what flavor, which, which ethnic flavor is it? But the question was immediately, um, uh, 
this division between communities and how we learn to live with each other. And those dialogues in those spaces can be really critical and really important. And in some ways, life-saving because they are not ones that are about necessarily, you know, high dollars and, you know, the acquisition of, of um, buildings and, you know, uh, real estate. So we need to advocate there as well and, and create more public space that is available for really innovative work. And um, uh, perhaps maybe in the training, uh, talk to artists about the difference between private work and public work. You may not choose to be a public artist. And maybe that's not the right place for this particular personal expression. But maybe what you have to say that's unique and from your perspective that we haven't seen should be in a public space and we should be able to learn to have the generosity to know it and see it and understand it and welcome it. And that's really what we're having to deal with as a whole, isn't it, as a, as a country? Yeah, that's right. I completely agree with you. And I think we have to advocate for leaders who understand that because when they don't, it can have a chilling effect. And then generations of, of mural creation, it can just be lost so easily, right? It can just backslide. And so um, I would, you know, to answer this question, I mean, you know, advise that people be really clear advocates for muralism and understand the importance that it has. And I do think it humanizes us. I have seen enough people work together on projects, not to, you know, to sugarcoat this, but that it has absolutely been able to sort of heal divides. And, and what does it mean to the city? I mean, if you close your eyes and you think of Philadelphia without murals, it would be just startling to think about that. Just like LA, if I think about LA without murals, it's just, you know, it's almost unimaginable, unfathomable. So, so I feel like it's, we have to hold on to that. I like Judy, what you said about thinking about the history, this, this sort of incredible arc of this art form is really, it matters. And, but we can't be complacent and we have to work to maintain it because the market developers, the sort of removal of murals, it happens very quickly. And, um, and we need to push back. I mean, we need to think about public space and what we as citizens want. All right, and preservation, because I mean, one of the things, that's, one of the ways that censorship occurs is by not maintaining you know, valuable and important works that are works that, that are, are valued by community. I've seen people create altars in front of murals uh, because it's that's so important to them in their community space. And yet somebody coming from outside would look at it and say, what are they doing? Why are they doing that, right? So, you know, education is one of the major things that we have to really continue to support. Like we have to teach people about our form. We have to give them the opportunity to understand it in a deeper way. Um, uh, we're we're going to be opening a show on um, at the end of May at the Getty, in which there's a comparison being made between 16th century muralists in Italy working with with a whole team of people to create this whole decoration of these these edifices in 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 this in the in in uh, Rome, and and the, the the piece done in the freeway for hitting the wall that I did in '84 for the Olympics. So in other words, the form is continuous. And there is a relationship between the drawings of those two different dramatically 16th century work and, 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 and 21st century work. So, or 20th century actually was 1980, 1984 when that piece was done. So I think one of the things is that kind of education is, an, is a moment that's really important. And yeah. I think also the preservation and, and, and conservation, we need to address that in, in very much more significant ways. And I think it's getting to our, um, you know, our political um, people. And and you you mentioned mayors, and you know, our productions in the city changed dramatically uh, according to who was mayor. Mm. It's interesting. Well, in Philly, I have to say that um, we 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 don't have. Really, I mean, there's not much of a Republican Party, so it's always Democrats. And we have made it through five mayors, and I hope we make it through six. I hope we make it through ten. Um, so <laughs> we'll keep hope alive. There's an election in a year and a half, but I think that the citizens of the city have spoken that they that this is valuable to them. Um, when murals go away, I'm going to quote Tracy Anderson of 
a, a, a community leader from uh, Point Breeze in, our, in South Philadelphia. She said, when murals go away, she feels like, she said, we feel like our lives are being erased. And so it's, it's really, we have to fight for it, but also education. I mean, I think academic institutions and art schools, along with city government, I think that's really critical. Um, yeah. yeah that's, that, I think, a concerted effort. I think, you know, one of the things that we, um, we did was we, we taught on the streets. That was the major point, point, point of our teaching. Uh, and I tried to uh, teach in the university. I taught muralism at UCLA and at UC Irvine um, within the, within the uh, um, California State University, I mean, Cal uh, UC universities. And it was really difficult because it wasn't a form that was really respected. And, um, uh, but I think more of, of that kind of teaching is really critical so that there's an option for um, uh, artists that are going through the process of training to train in this direction. That's right. That's why I think there's such potential Netanyahu for the Institute, because I think it's really about this knowledge sharing. It's, it's about the particular city, but it's also about the field that needs to be lifted up. Right. Yeah, the field needs to advance as a whole. And I think it's important, you know, for us to have discussions like the, these two programs have been developing and living, you know, across the country from each other. And, um, and yet we this kind of conversation is the first we're having in a mm -hmm. public way. And I think it's really important to, you know, to say, where, where did we flourish? And I can say for, for having been in this movement from the, from the very beginning of it, like in the early seventies, my first mural in 1970, um, we flourished when there was less oversight by public authorities. We flourished in the place where people could come together as a, a, a community group and say, we're gonna paint the outside of our community center. And there wasn't an authority at the city level that said, we have to approve that, right? Uh, and I, so, I mean, yes, that's a, it's a little scary that you, you know, people are starting to paint everything all over the city. What about the idea that um, you know, some of my favorite works that I've cooperated on and collaborated with have been like with the Central American Research and Education Center and a story that I didn't really know uh, about the, the arrival of Central Americans in the 80s in Los Angeles in the Pico Union area. And because it was their building and it was an interior space, we could simply see the will of the people carried out in the imagery. Mm. And so, so my hands and my, my capacity as an artist went to the service of their experience. And that was profound, profound for me and profound for all the people who participated, the young people who participated. And so I think um, more of that kind of freedom for community groups to express themselves. Yeah. And, that, and we got, we, get, we, didn't, we didn't compromise. So in many, many points uh, along the way, we were defunded. Right. If you put this mural up, we're taking all of your money. And so, and so I basically said, so be it. You know, I kept thinking, okay, then what? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's like, but always what's so amazing is that I have to say every time that happened, and one of them was a, for a mural that was a profound mural, one of the most important murals in LA by a, an artist that we have just lost, Noni Olablisi, called To Protect and Serve. And that's the motto of the LAPD. And the imagery that was so controversial was simply uh, an image of uh, the, the Black Panthers and questioning what Black leadership was at this particular moment in this community. And it was as if we were reviving the Black Panthers, as if they were coming back into the streets. And that mural just became, we went to 28 meetings in the, in the uh, Arts Commission to review it. In every case, they kept bringing us back with an objection and we kept answering the objection and coming back. And that mural is still one of the most beautiful and significant murals in our city. Yeah, and, I know that mural it is. Yeah. Beautiful. yeah, so that, so that and we lost all of our funding and exactly at the same time that we lost all of our funding, the great, the great story is that um, uh, LA Confidential was making that movie, LA Confidential. And they came through and wanted to, to film in our jail 
And exactly the, the spirits decided that they would give us back exactly the amount of money we lost in the, in the defunding because they paid us to use this facility. So it was like, we got saved. And I kept thinking, well, there's just you know, something kind of profound that you, know, you have to trust in some way that if you do the right thing, maybe it'll work out. I mean, you know, maybe it won't. So maybe you go without, you go on an unemployment again, you know, which, uh, which is what I did uh, when we didn't have money, you know. So for us, I mean, I have to say, I, so I'm appreciative to the city of Philadelphia because we have some degree of autonomy and support. We don't have, there's not sort of a draconian process of L&I approval. There isn't when, when um, the billboard companies tried to bear down on us, the city intervened and really told them to hit the road that this was something very different. I and mean, they, they came to our defense. I mean, we were going to, we were prepared to argue with them to the end of the earth, but we didn't have to because they were, they See, were good. That's really big, important. That's a profound moment in, within the city of Philadelphia because we lost that battle and the mural programs went down. Yeah, we, we, we need to hold, we need to really hold on to that because that was, that's, it was, a, it was absolutely a victory because they were coming to, to us, they were coming after us and they just said, what you do and we do is exactly the same. I'm like, I don't see, how is this the same? We're talking about hope and inspiration and you're doing gap ads. I don't think so, like stop. But they could have just rolled right over us. But I remember the l &I commissioner going, we got your back. It's not going to happen here in Philly. I told them what was going on in LA and Portland and other cities. That's and amazing. They walked. They 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 left us alone. Mm -hmm. I want to just honor one more audience question because I think this will be a good question to sort of close on and allow you both to also maybe share a final <laughs> word of encouragement <laughs> or mission statement for the audience here. But someone here is asking what happens when a building with a mural is torn down, right? Like what, what do you do when a mural goes away? So let me just answer that because I'm, I'm like stalking developers all the time. And if there's some developers on this call, just listen. <laughs> First, you need to notify someone when you're doing it, like just driving by and seeing that a work of art has been crushed is terrible, terrible for the community, for the artists, for the city. It eats at the soul of the city. So what we're trying to do is introduce an amendment that would would enforce this, that would in, that the developer would have to notify mural arts or whoever the commissioning entity is. And there would have to be a conversation about how the mural gets if the mural cannot remain, then it should be, there should be a contribution made to help this mural be redone. The murals are civic assets. We need to start there. We need to start there with what Judy, I think you said it eloquently, putting muralism in its proper context. And we need to shine a light on it. We need to lift it up. You wouldn't go into the Philadelphia Museum of Art and start destroying the collection. It would be unthinkable, right? And yet we we build in front of like landmark works of art in our city. How is, and across the nation, how is it possible? We have to stop it and we have to make people accountable. I don't, I'm not saying we stand in the way of economic development. Like I get it. That's like impossible, but there's got to be a sea change in how we see the art form and we have to value it. And it has to start now. I absolutely agree. And I think there are many <clears throat> part of the, the uh, research that we've been doing in the digital lab and over the last 23 years is how to deal with loss of, of murals. Like, and now we are in a position where we can actually digitize a mural and create a high resolution file so that it can be replicated at full scale. In other words, it's just amazing because new, the new processes are such that we could move a mural, put it on a substrate, print it on a substrate, and then put it up in a new space. And if you wanted to um, change the scale, you could. If you wanted to paint back into it, you could. But that process of the replication of a lost mural is, is accessible to us now. That's wonderful. No reason to destroy a work. I love it. I'm going to be learning from you more. That's mm -hmm. great. Thank you both so much. Um, would either of you want to share any final remarks, anything to push us into the future and, and advise and inspire us? Why, what, just one word, maybe <clears throat> one thought is that um, the most 
wonderful experience, really. One of the highest light points of my life has been to be able to work with a team and to be able to hand off a brush to somebody alongside of me and to watch that, to work in a kind of choreographed dance of painting with one another. It's those experiences bond you with other people in a way that lasts a lifetime. The kids from the Great Wall are still in my life from all those years past. And um, it's, it's like a dance. It's like a, 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 choreo a choreographed movement. And it's relationship to the place and to the people. It's all made in connectedness. And this no notion of connecting to one another is really one of the biggest things that we face. We have to find ways to do this. And we have to find ways to bring art to the process of our spiritual development and our, our, our development of our humanity. So muralism is the place that can do that. Thank you. Um, I totally agree. I think for me, Netanyahu, I mean, standing at a mural dedication and seeing um, a group of people that look like the city that are connecting with each other. Sometimes they're people whose paths have not crossed. Um, and looking at this work of art and being truly moved by it or talking to artists and feeling the excitement, it's palpable that they have around sometimes for the first time creating work in public space or talking to our guild participants or people who've had zero exposure to art because our society is so unfair and yet feeling the joy they have that they've been able to impact the built environment of the city in a really profound way. That's really what makes me feel that any aggravation or obstacles or walls that come our way, you, you, you push through it because it's really what's, what's on display. And Judy, I th you just said this, it's really the, it's the profound beauty of the human spirit. And that's what we see every day that we're doing the work. And that I think drives both of us forward. Yeah, well said, well said, Jane. Lovely to yeah. speak with you this afternoon. Judy, I love you. We want you to come to Philly to do a mural. We're gonna work on that. <laughs> and we're coming we'll to work. LA in the fall to see your work. Yes, we'll work on it. We'll, we'll find a way to do it together. Thank you so much, both of you. This is just such a moving conversation. Um, and thank you all for everyone in the audience. Thank you for your great questions and uh, your time with us here. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Judy. Bye.